Coming up on this episode of Typology and Prophecy. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. In this episode, we're going to identify the typological connection between the serpent that God cursed in the Garden of Eden and Daniel 11's King of the South. Welcome to Typology and Prophecy. My name is Kyle. This is a podcast dedicated to the study of the Bible through the methodology of typology. This is part four in our series on Genesis chapter three, the typology of the fall. In the first three episodes, we focused on the typological connection between the narrative of man's fall and our redemption in Christ. Now, I want to shift gears slightly away from the soteriology that we find in Genesis three to the eschatology that we likewise find embedded in the three curses that in Genesis three, God dealt out to the serpent, to the woman, and to the man. In this episode, we're going to identify the typological connection between the serpent that God cursed in the Garden of Eden and Daniel 11's King of the South. Now, if you do find this study helpful, please consider pairing your watching of it with its companion video that you see there on your screen, The King of the South, prequel to Antichrist. Now, there are two instances in the Old Testament where the prophet in question will be talking about the fall of an earthly king, and then without warning, he will seamlessly transition into talking about the fall of Lucifer. The first of these two instances is found in Isaiah chapter 14. The chapter opens with the prophet being told to take up a proverb against the king of Babylon, and then right in the middle of describing said fall of Babylon, Isaiah transitions right into an alternate narrative that begins with, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Now, despite Lucifer's stated desire to ascend into heaven and to be like the Most High, verse 15 predicted a more somber and realistic end to Lucifer's ambitions. It reads, Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Now, the second instance of this is found in Ezekiel chapter 28. We read, The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, Because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am a God, and I sit in the seat of gods, in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man and not a God. Now, dropping down to verse 7. Behold, therefore I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom, and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit, where have we read that before, and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the sea. Now, this prophecy is talking about the actual king of Tyre, and it was most fully and literally fulfilled by none other than Alexander the Great. However, as the chapter continues, we see Ezekiel do, just as Isaiah had, which is transition right into talking about Lucifer. We read in verse 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty, You were in Eden, the garden of God. Now, right off the bat here, we know that Ezekiel is no longer talking about the literal king of Tyre, for no earthly king has ever stepped foot in the garden of Eden. Rather, from verse 14, we know that he is talking about Lucifer as it states, You were the anointed cherub who covers, I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. 
Okay, so having determined that Ezekiel was talking about Lucifer and not the literal king of Tyre, we still need to answer the question, how was Lucifer in the Garden of Eden? Well, John tells us the answer in the book of Revelation. It reads, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The phrase that John uses here, that serpent of old, refers to, drumroll please, the serpent who in the Garden of Eden deceived Eve. It says in Genesis 3 verse 13, And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Now, before we leave Isaiah and Ezekiel behind to dive deeper into Genesis chapter 3, I want to highlight a couple of important points. Isaiah equates the fall of Babylon typologically with the fall of Lucifer, while Ezekiel describes the prince of Tyre with language that is almost indistinguishable from the language that we would expect to see if Ezekiel had just been describing Lucifer himself. The point here is this. From the perspective of the Bible, there is a very thin line, if there is a line at all, between how the Bible distinguishes Lucifer from the kings and kingdoms that reflect his image, and or the empires that he has complete control over in this world. In other words, Lucifer does have a tangible and visible presence in this world just as he had a tangible and visible presence via the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Now, while it is fairly common knowledge that the serpent is Satan, what is often underemphasized is the fact that the serpent was merely a medium. Satan's use of this specific medium resulted in the serpent becoming a type, a symbol, and or a personification of how Satan would manifest himself tangibly in the natural realm of man. We see this fact established in the curse that God gave out to the serpent. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. When applying typology to scripture, we do not want to overlook the plain or literal reading of the text. On the one hand, this curse caused the creatures that we call snakes to have to crawl on their bellies. This is the literal, straightforward reading of the text. However, when we apply typology to the medium of the serpent, what we understand is this. Every medium used by Satan thereafter would likewise fall under this curse. It makes no difference whether we're talking about literal snakes slithering around on their bellies or whether we're talking about the wrath of God being poured out on Egypt, the most powerful nation in the ancient world that just so happened to enslave God's people and would not let them go. The curse is universal to each and every medium that Satan has is or will yet use in his crusade to erase the image of God in man. We see this concept confirmed in the next verse. Still speaking to the serpent, God continues, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now keep in mind that this verse is a continuation of the curse that God is placing on the serpent in verse 14. Also, keep in mind that this verse is prophetic, which means that the effects of its words extend far beyond just that singular moment in time in the Garden of Eden. It prophesied that throughout history, Satan would have a seed line of his own that would reflect his image, not God's. Again, a tangible manifestation of Lucifer in this world, through the medium of the serpent's seed. And we're not talking about snakes crawling through the grass here. 
what we're talking about here is the seed of the serpent that would manifest itself through individuals and their lineages, nations, economic and monetary systems, religions, and philosophies and ideologies. In Revelation chapter 12, the Apostle John wrote, So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Now, first things first. John is using symbolic language here in the book of Revelation. Does anyone really think that John is talking about a snake slithering through the grass, chasing after a woman, and when he gets close enough to her, he, he literally spews water out of his mouth? No, of course not. The serpent spoken of here is the end time typological manifestation of the serpent seed that dates back to the Garden of Eden. Now, we're going to cover the symbolism of the woman in the next episode, so make sure to tune in to that one as well. But even without any interpretation whatsoever, the similarities between this verse here in Revelation and the curse given by God to the serpent in Genesis 3 verses 14 and 15 are fairly obvious to see. As in both passages, we have a serpent, a woman, and some type of conflict, i.e. enmity, going on between the two of them. Now, the question ultimately comes down to this. Between Genesis 3 and Revelation 12, and the 6,000 years in between, who has the seed of the serpent represented? Well, first of all, we have to acknowledge that there would have been a pre-flood manifestation of the serpent seed that for all intents and purposes should have been considered destroyed by the flood, except for the fact that we see the serpent in Revelation chapter 12 very much alive and very much not destroyed. Therefore, and given the fact that there were only eight souls who survived the flood, we must conclude then that from the lineage of one of Noah's three sons, the seed of the serpent found its way into the post-flood new world. Now, before we continue with this thought, I want to point out something that has, for the most part, gone unrecognized. This is important not only for this subject in this episode, but likewise relevant for the next two as well. In Genesis chapter 3, there are three characters that are present and central to the narrative of man's fall. These three are, of course, the serpent, the woman, and the man. There are likewise, and consequently, also three curses that God pronounced in the Garden of Eden. Now, here's the point. Coming out of the Garden of Eden, what we see are three seed-slash-image lines. There is the seed of the serpent, the seed, capital S, of the woman, and the image of man. Now, I would argue that all three of these are accounted for in the world today. There are those of us who bear the image of the seed of the woman, i.e. Christ. There are those who bear the image of the first Adam, i.e. the man, and there are those who bear the image of Satan, i.e. the seed of the serpent. Now, because there are three seed-slash-image lines that come out of the Garden of Eden, it is relevant to point out once again that Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, because of Abraham, we know that Christ, the seed of the woman, came from the line of Shem. That means the post-flood seed of the serpent either came from the line of Ham or the line of Japheth. Regarding the condition of man before the flood, the Bible has this to say, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Sound familiar? And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. 
Now, we have to keep in mind that Noah's three sons grew up in and lived in the world just described here. They were very familiar with the nature of the sins and the evil that existed prior to the flood. They were also very aware that it was the wickedness of man that had brought about the destruction of the world. However, notwithstanding the fact that they had every reason not to do so, one of them still chose to reintroduce a pre-flood abomination into their post-flood new world. It says in Genesis chapter 9, And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk, and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Now, there are varying opinions about what actually happened here. Some believe that Ham simply just saw his father naked. Others, such as myself, believe that either Ham or Canaan committed an act of sodomy against Noah. Still others believe that Ham committed the unthinkable with his own mother. Now look, regardless of who did what to who, the thing that is indisputable is that Noah woke up the next morning and cursed Canaan. It says, So Noah woke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brethren. From this, I would argue that it should be fairly indisputable that it was Ham and his descendants that reestablished the line of the serpent's seed in the post-flood New World. Now, some of the notable cities and or kingdoms that were established by the sons of Ham in the ancient world are Babel, as in the Tower of Babel. This was founded by Nimrod, the son of Cush and the grandson of Ham. Then we have the infamous cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, which were founded by the descendants of Canaan. Even the land in which these cities were located bore the name of Ham's son, i.e. the land of Canaan. And lastly, we have the most powerful and prominent of all kingdoms in the ancient world, i.e. Egypt. In the Psalms it says, Israel also came into Egypt, and Jacob dwelt in the land of Ham. So here it is calling Egypt the land of Ham. Again we read, He sent Moses his servant and Aaron whom he had chosen. They performed his signs among them and wonders in the land of Ham. And for good measure, here is one more. He made a path for his anger. He did not spare their soul from death, but gave their life over to the plague and destroyed all the firstborn in Egypt, the first of their strength in the tents of Ham. Ham. So, why does the psalmist refer to Egypt as the land of Ham? Well, because it was Mizram, the son of Ham, and his descendants who founded the kingdom of Egypt. In fact, the name Mizram, as we have it in our English translations, could have, and probably most likely just should have, been translated directly as Egypt rather than Mizram. Now, I want to take a moment and put up there on your screen a few images that illustrate the tangible connection that existed between the serpent and his ancient seed, i.e. the pharaohs, who, as you can see there, are all depicted with a serpent protruding out of their foreheads. So, what does this mean? Well, I believe that it establishes that the sons of Ham collectively, and Egypt most specifically because of its sheer prominence, became in and of themselves typological symbols equal to that of the serpent in the Garden of Eden. In other words, if the Bible were to use the sons of Ham in a typological manner, to refer to an end-time king such as, oh, I don't know, let's say the king of the south in Daniel chapter 11, 
or a beast system, such as the one that ascends out of the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 11, that would indicate that the Bible is ascribing to these two, i.e. the beast and the king of the south, the role of being the end-time manifestation of the serpent's seed, which would thus make the curse against the serpent a relevant typological prophecy all the way down to the close of Earth's history. Now, I want you to notice here the typological language that the Apostle John uses to describe the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. He wrote, when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. These are two ancient kingdoms that were established by the sons of Ham. However, it says which spiritually is called, which means these are typological references, not literal ones. In other words, Revelation is telling us, that there will be an end-time beast system that is typologically likened to the ancient kingdom of Egypt, which also means it will be likened typologically to the serpent's seed. We see the same connection between Egypt and the king of the south in Daniel chapter 11. Regarding the original king of the south at the beginning of Daniel chapter 11, we read, And he shall carry their gods captive to Egypt with their princes and their precious articles of silver and gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. Now why does the king of the south carry these icons and other treasures back to Egypt? Well, because Egypt is where he is from. When Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was divided amongst his four generals. Ptolemy ruled in Egypt. He and his heirs are referred to in Daniel chapter 11 as the king of the south. Now, this, of course, is in reference to the division of the Macedonian Greek Empire. However, when we get to verse 40, we're no longer talking about ancient history but rather events that will take place at the time of the end. He reads, At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, with many ships. He shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. So at the time of the end, the king of the south will attack him, and in response, the king of the north will come back at him like a whirlwind. Now, as we continue, I want you to notice specifically who the targets are of the King of the North's whirlwind counterattack. It reads, He shall enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and what? The land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. So let's connect the dots here. In the Garden of Eden, the serpent is cursed, and in that curse, it is prophesied by God that the serpent would have his own seed line throughout human history. We see this confirmed in Revelation chapter 12, that the prophecy of Genesis 3.15 is still very much alive and in play right down to the end of time. Now, after the flood, it was Ham and his descendants who reestablished the serpent seed line in the post-flood New World. The most prominent of all three kingdoms established by Ham's descendants was, of course, Egypt. And now it is Egypt that we see here, who is the target of the King of the North's whirlwind counterattack, which means that the King of the South at the time of the end will be typological Egypt, and therefore it will also be the end-time manifestation of 
the serpent's seed. Now here's something that's very interesting that you might just have missed as we read through the description of the King of the North's whirlwind counterattack. And that is that each one of Ham's four sons are accounted for as targets of the King of the North. Now, did you catch that as we read through Daniel 11, 40 through 43? I know you saw Egypt as that was the obvious one, and that's the one that we pointed out. But what about the other three sons? Well, if not, and if you would like to understand how all four of the sons of Ham are referred to typologically here in Daniel chapter 11, please go down to the description and look for the link to the video you see there on your screen, The King of the South, prequel to Antichrist. In that video, I explain it verse by verse and detail by detail. Well, that would do it for this episode of Typology and Prophecy. If you watched till the end, you are super awesome and you have my sincere gratitude. Please leave me a comment down below and let me know what you think. If you were blessed, please smash that like button and consider supporting me by purchasing one or even both of my books. They're available on Amazon. Links are in the description and pinned comments below. Thank you for joining me today and God bless.